I'm going to take every complicated and controversial issue of our day and simplify it. Creation, not evolution. Creative order, not primordial ooze. Intelligent design, not random processes. You're the crown of that creation. And you are image bearers of God as men and women and boys and girls. And because God is the author of life, it leads me to my next point. Life begins at conception and should never end in abortion, period. And because it's a human body crafted and created by God's choice, it's never my body, my choice. Okay, let's go a little bit deeper. God established it biological order. It's two genders, not transgender. It's that simple. It's one man plus one woman equals marriage. God's word defines that. And no, it's not love is love unless sin is sin. Because if it's love is love, then incestuous love is love? Well, well, no. Adulterous love is love? Well, no. Pedophilia love is love? Well, no. But, but love your neighbor, but you can't love your neighbor without first loving God. And that's what Jesus said. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. Oh, by the way, and the second is like it. In other words, God defines love and you love him in return. And then he prepares you to love your neighbor. And love never lacks truth. And by the way, Genesis chapter 5 says God made man in mankind or the human race. Let me make it simple. There's only one race. It's the human race. So yes, black lives matter, white lives matter, all lives matter, but more than that, Christian, eternal life matters. Let me make it very simple. Males are better than females at being males. And females are better than males at being females. Now, you might go, man, you beat this horse up week after week. I say, no, I'm not. I'm actually not beating the dead horse. I'm arousing a sleeping lion. And all these issues I just rattled off, they're not cultural, they're scriptural. And here's why it matters. We are fighting these lies at the schoolhouse, at the White House, simply because we've neglected the laying of these foundations in our house. So I do wanna begin by reminding you that the word of God tells us not only what has happened, it tells us what always happens. And you gotta get that. It's not only historical, it's also prophetic. I say it's predictive, predicts what God's plan is, what his will is, what he wants to reveal to his church. It's predictive, it rolls over to what is prescriptive. It gives me exactly what I need when I need it. The words of God are life, they're truth. They are for the refreshment of the soul. It's predictive, it tells what happened, it always tells what will happen, it is prescriptive, it gives me what I need in the midst of it all. And finally, it's proactive, it always arrives on time. What we need to do is not take what's happening in our world and try to fit it into the word. What we do is take the word and shine that light on the world. That's my task tonight. Take the word of God, the light of God's word, and shine it on the world. Illuminate and be able to see what's happening around us. What is the church's responsibility in the midst of it all? Are we just here existing until God decides to remove us? What's my responsibility in the midst of it? Am I taking the gospel? Am I leading people to Christ? Not only verbally, visually. Do they see my life? Is there anything attractive about what I'm putting out in my conduct, 
that is drawing people to be curious about what it is I say I have and I believe. Now I want to jump back into a, a, a verse in Matthew 16 that we began with last time, just to orient your heart and mind around the importance of reading or discerning the signs of the times. Let's begin. Matthew 16, verses 1 through 3. Then the Pharisees and Sadducees came, testing him, that's Jesus, asked that he should show them a sign from heaven. He answered and said to them, when it is evening, you say, it will be fair weather, for the sky is red. In the morning, it will be foul weather today, for the sky is red and threatening. Hypocrites. You know how to discern the face of the sky, but you cannot discern the signs of the times. Here's Jesus answering their question about a sign from heaven. And I always found that comical. They're speaking to the son of heaven. He's the ultimate sign. His first coming was prophesied and predicted in over 300 prophecies. So there he is fulfilling the scriptures that the Pharisees and Sadducees, it's sad, you see, it's sad. <laughs> they couldn't see what was standing right in front of them. And Jesus used the weather. Every morning when you wake up, you look out on the horizon and you discern what type of day it will be. When you see certain formations of clouds, the sky, it's threatening bad weather. We do the same today. We have weather forecasters who are no prophets by any stretch of the imagination because it's unpredictable. They might predict a certain weather pattern, physically speaking, with all the sonar and radar and technological advancements we have to read. I mean, they can tell you where a tornado is going to touch down to the second Recently, they're trying to track Hurricane Lee. How many different reports have you read about where it's going and where it's headed? Who knows? Now, they can closely tell you the impact. But the point is, if we can read the weather, Jesus wants to know how come we're not applying that same discernment to read the times. Remember, it takes physical eyesight to forecast the weather, but it requires biblical insight. And here we go. Biblical insight, biblical knowledge, Holy Spirit discernment to forecast the world. So yes, physical hurricanes will come and they will go and they will leave devastation in their wake. But I don't know about you, church, but I could see a spiritual hurricane on the horizon a spiritual hurricane of lawlessness that is brewing. Wickedness taking formation in the clouds. And only the word of God can prepare us. Remember, this message is not to scare, it's to prepare. It's to position us to understand our role. I love the analogy of the telescope. Again, I want to put it in front of you because when you read the word of God, like a telescope, which takes that which is far and brings it near. It takes that which is blurry, I can't see it, change the lens and makes it clear. That's the word of God. There are things that may seem like they're far off. Oh, that'll never happen in my lifetime. But through the word of God, it brings it near. There's always a sense of urgency in the word of God. Every time Jesus mentioned watch, Pay attention, take heed. He was emphasizing urgency. The Apostle Paul wrote with urgency. The Apostle John, at the end of his life, he wrote with a sense of urgency. He believed that Jesus was going to return in his life. So he lived accordingly. The word of God takes that which is blurry. It's hard to tell the difference between truth and lies these days. And yet the word of God, this lens, when you look through this word, it helps bring clarity. Remember, those who are looking for Jesus are the same people who are living for Jesus. You can't disconnect 
the two. If you're looking for him, his arrival at any time, you will be living for him. And I'll be honest, as one of your pastors, the times where I'm not looking for Christ, I'm not living for Christ. I'm living for me. My priorities, my agenda, my ambitions. And the Lord has to get my undivided attention to look back to him so that I begin living for him. When I say looking for him, I'm talking about being watchful. Pay attention, take heed. Jesus used that phrase multiple times. Watch. He used it in reference to the disciples praying with him. Watch, pray. He used it in reference to deceivers. Take heed that no one deceives you. Pay attention. Are you recognizing the conflicting voices today? Do you recognize there are really only two kingdoms? The kingdom of light and the kingdom of darkness. And when you understand that, you are able to filter through all the noise back to the word of God. Is this of the kingdom of light and I should stand firm on it? Or is this the kingdom of darkness pushing that wicked agenda? Look, watch. To live for him means be faithful, remain faithful. Looking for him, watchful. Living for him, faithful. What has God entrusted to you? What has he given you? Relationships? Resources? Health? Trouble? What is it that you are supposed to steward for his glory? Now, there are really only two major events in the Bible. There is other ones that have a bearing on these two major events, and I'm sure you can guess them. The first major event was the first coming of Christ. Well, that happened. The second major event is the second coming of Christ. That has not happened, which is interesting because a lot of people say this, I wish I lived during the Bible times while missing the reality that they are in the middle. <laughs> okay, now you're tracking with me. In the middle of Bible times, Christ already came and the word of God predicted it. And it tells us that he's coming again. And we are in an age where we look forward to the return of Jesus. And there's a lot of confusion around the end times. And Jesus gave us signs or symptoms of those times. Paul would write explicitly about the signs of the times, always connected to the second coming of Christ and even connected to the nation of Israel in some form or fashion. So Paul would write to a church that was known as the Thessalonians in Thessalonica, which was in Northern Macedonia. And he would write this in his second letter to them, chapter two, if you're taking notes, verses one to four, and we'll take our time here. Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, there it is, and our gathering together to him, we ask you, now pause. The language seems to suggest in the original Greek, when Paul wrote this, it seems to suggest that he's talking about one event with two aspects. The first thing he is saying concerning the coming of the Lord Jesus and our gathering to him, that seems to be two separate aspects of one event, which is interesting. Now remember, I am under the biblical persuasion that the church, according to the first letter that Paul wrote to the Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verses 16 to 18 specifically, that there is some type of snatching away, a catching away, a rapture. Some say that word's not in the Bible. No, that's because the word rapture is Latin. It's related to the word a seizing of sorts, grabbing somebody by their shirt and pulling them out of the way. It says, not everyone's gonna die. What? Yeah, Paul, Paul said, there's a mystery I want to tell you about. Not everybody's going to go to sleep. 
in the twinkling of an eye, we'll all be changed. Then he writes to this church in Thessalonica and he says, hey, the dead in Christ shall rise first and then those who are alive and remain shall be called up and meet the Lord where? In the clouds. So it seems to suggest that the Lord's second coming, his return, his establishment of his kingdom is distinct and separate from this snatching, this gathering. And that's why he's writing this second letter. Verse two, I write you and I ask you not to soon be shaken in mind or troubled either by spirit or by word or by letter as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. What is he saying? He went, touched down with this church. He taught verbally. He, he left. He writes a letter to them, expounding on the teaching he left with them. That's 1 Thessalonians. He leaves. He gets wind of a rumor that they think they're in the midst of the great tribulation, that the day of Christ had come, and that somehow, some way, they missed the rapture, and they're panicking. And Paul says, listen, don't be shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit, means maybe somebody stood up and gave a word of prophecy in his absence. By word, somebody started a conversation that was contrary to his teaching and his first letter, or by letter. Bible scholars believe there was a false letter that came after his first letter that said the opposite of what Paul said. So he's writing a second letter and he's course correcting them and he's saying to them, and he's, what he's gonna say is, the day of Christ has not come. And here's how you know the day of Christ. Some euphemisms for the day of Christ. Jacob's trouble. The 70th week of Daniel. The great tribulation, capital G, capital T the day of Christ. It's not just a singular day. It's an event when the Lord returns. He's like, here's how you know it has not happened. Verse three, let no one deceive you by any means, deception. For that day will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. So what are some elements here? What are some signs that must precede the coming of Christ? The falling away. The falling away, the apostasy of the church or the apostasy of the world. It means people are departing from what is normative, what is religious, what is sacred. People leaving the church, people deconstructing their faith. He's saying Christ can't come until falling away happens and the man of sin or the man of perdition or to be very clear, the antichrist comes. So you're not in the day of the Lord. You're not in the great tribulation. He adds to that. Verse four, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshiped so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. That hasn't happened. Now what's interesting about this, there are several signs falling away, great apostasy. When we say apostasy, you can also say lawlessness fits the bill. Lawlessness is not always tyranny or anarchy. Lawlessness is also moral relativity, not submitting to the law of God, the moral law of God. So people are plotting their own course, living out their own truth. That's a falling away. And he's saying that hasn't happened, it will happen. And then the Antichrist is going to rise through that vein. And then he's going to establish his throne in the very temple, which is supposed to be sacred, which, by the way, is currently under construction in Jerusalem right now. I don't see a construction in your contacts. To who? Speaking of artificial intelligence. The Temple Institute currently has the blueprints to build a third temple which means if that begins to happen, you are seeing signs of the times. This guy called the son of perdition, the man of sin, the antichrist, he's going to demand worship from all of the world. He's a counterfeit. He wants to take what is given to God and he wants it for himself. That's described to a T in Revelation chapter 13. Now remember, if we're looking at signs and symptoms, we're looking for 
traces of a falling away. Is that happening today? Are people leaving the church in unprecedented numbers? Are people deconstructing their faith? Are we witnessing a falling away of sorts? But the Antichrist is not here. Well, well the point is, before he can come, there's got to be a culture of Antichrist. See, the more Antichrist the world becomes, the readier it will be for the Antichrist to come. That's the point. The more Antichrist planet Earth becomes, and I'll define Antichrist in a moment, the readier the world will be to receive the Antichrist, capital A. So Jesus talked about contractions, contractions that are related to the birthing process. Moms know that with contractions, they increase in interval and intensity. Contractions help prepare the body for delivery. Let me say that one more time. Contractions help prepare the body of Christ for her delivery. And as contractions increase in pace and power, this is how you know labor is advancing to the final hour. It's how a mom would know. So are we in the final hour? According to John, we are. First John chapter two, verse 18, what does he say? He says, little children, it is the last hour. Now he said this at the end of the first century, almost 2000 years later, this is what he says about the last hour. As you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, capital A, even now many lowercase Antichrists have come, a spirit that has been unleashed, which we know that, is, that it is the last hour. So John's like, you want to know a sign? The Antichrist is not coming. He will come. But the lowercase Antichrist, that spirit, which is unleashed on planet Earth through, through degenerate, and reprobate minds of men and women, the spirit of Antichrist is currently sweeping the world. Now, if John said they were in the last hour, you don't have to be a Bible scholar to deduce that if they were in the last hour at the end of the first century and we're in the 21st century, then we're probably in the last minutes. Did you see what I did there? Just by saying you said last hour and 2000 years have passed, we must be in the last minutes. Now, let me define for you Antichrist. This is a big misunderstanding. Antichrist has two definitions. By way of the word anti, it seems to suggest that Antichrist ideology is against Christ, right? Or resists Christ, opposes Christ. Right, so you can identify something that's antichrist when it's blatantly attacking that which is Christian, okay? That's antichrist. But that's not the only definition. The other definition is that which replaces Christ, okay? Now we're talking about false religion. Now we're talking about false teaching. Now we're talking about things that sound good, but without having a knowledge of the word of God, can deceive and mislead. Antichrist equals Resist Christ, and that's easier to identify. That's often the enemy trying to attack the church from the outside in. The opposition and persecution that can be labeled. What's harder to identify is the antichrist spirit that replaces him. Religion based on good works, that's antichrist. Confessing your sins in a booth to a man and not the high priest himself, antichrist. I can go on and on about the false religions that seek to replace Christ. That's what all of them do. But my goal is to swing you back into some of the signs and contractions that Jesus listed for us. Verse 7 and 8 in Matthew 24, I'll read them for you. Remember, when you see nation rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and then you witness famines and pestilences and earthquakes, in strange places, various places, Jesus said, all these are beginning of sorrows. Back to contractions. All these are contractions. Now, of course, 
from the time he said it, nation has risen against nation and political system has risen against political system. Nothing new under the sun. There have been famines and pestilences and, and earthquakes in various places. But the question is, have they increased in intensity and power and remote location since the time Jesus said it? We're watching storms and natural disasters that are happening on a global scale in more frequency than ever before. We are watching, we are on the verge of World War III. Did you know that? With one wrong move by any of the world's actors, you got Putin's Russia meeting and coming into a union with communist China and North Korea and Iran, and Iran wants to blow Israel off the map. And then you have America funding Iran's pursuit to get nukes. This is all happening. And Israel right there, the nation of Israel. Now, mind you, the nation and political state of Israel on the map is separate entirely from spiritual Israel as God will save them in the end times. Okay, so not every Jew is going to be redeemed. That's Romans chapter 9 to Romans chapter 11. It's clear as day. God has not forsaken his people. And when I looked at the nation rising against nation, and I said, be careful when you judge national conflicts and think one guy's good and one guy's bad because Ukraine has been painted as this, you know, we got to get behind Ukraine and wow, look at them. It's like, that's not how you got to view it. The word of God says, be careful because you have no idea what God is doing in the midst of the Russian and Ukrainian conflict. But when you know Bible, you go, oh my gosh, that's what the Bible says is going to happen. Russia's getting closer and closer to attacking Israel. So they're just making alliances on their way. And I know that in the word of God. So I'm able to be confident when I see these things unfold. But at the end of the day, whether it's World War III breaking out, nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom, Back up, Christian, because like I said earlier, it's really only two kingdoms clashing. It's the kingdom of Christ and the kingdom of the Antichrist. And eventually God is going to remove his restraint. And when that happens, regardless of the clash between nation and nation and political system and political system, it's all going to roll over to a one world order. And we are in the conditioning stages, the early stages of that happening. How do I know that? Because anytime these types of things happen, World War III, natural disaster, diseases and pestilences, these are all signs of a world in crisis. And what do we know about a world in crisis? Well, to take the famous quote, you can never let a good crisis go to waste. Do you understand there are evil people in high places that are harnessed by hell, whether they realize it or not, and they will not allow a crisis go to waste. And they will seek to do whatever they have to do to consolidate their power unto themselves. We just went through a dry run or a trial run through 2020 of what that would look like. Now, let me kind of help you understand Christ our Lord, our Savior, our King, our God came and died to save sinners and wretches like us. He established his church, which he called his body. He is the head of that church. In the head is the mind. We know the mind, the central computing or processing system of the human body controls all of our movements. Christ's head governs his body. And we are the body of Christ on earth. Think about that analogy. Here we sit. We are part of Christ's body. He governs it from heaven where he sits at the right hand of the Father. He is not biting his nails. He is not panicking. He is in complete control over everything. He is allowing the world to unfold the way it is because he has a plan He's waiting for the church to wake up and to take him at his word and to live as if today was the last day that I had on planet earth. 
So I want to be like Christ. I want to share his message. I want to be what he said through the Apostle Paul, I am. I am an ambassador of his kingdom. An ambassador goes with the same authority and the rights of the kingdom that is sending them. Do any of us understand the weight of that responsibility? I'll go first. I don't. I'm a work in process. I need to be reminded of the authority Christ has given me. And I represent him. What is Antichrist then? Well, it's the opposite of what Christ represented. Christ came to salvage, which means the spirit of the Antichrist brings nothing but carnage. Christ came to bring liberty, to set the captives free, which means you can identify the spirit of Antichrist with anyone in a high place who looks to bring in slavery or worldly godless conformity. Christ came, spiritually speaking, to demask me. That was a hypocrite, which means the spirit of the Antichrist wants to put a mask back on me. We'll get that later. Christ said, let all the children come and then use them as an example of their sweet and beautiful innocence. He said, your faith should be like a child. Let them come, which means the spirit of the Antichrist wants the children to come to destroy their innocence. Are you recognizing it yet? Christ came and laid down his life and the spirit of Antichrist in man wants their lives lifted up. Christ came to lay his life down. Man wants his life lifted up. Now, why is this important? Well, whether you want to admit this or not, we are currently watching evil unfold, both from the outside in, in our country, and yes, from the inside out within our country. Evil knows no bounds. Do not underestimate what is currently happening. There are concentrated demonic forces that want to destroy America. And I don't say this in any derogatory way. I say it in the most sincere spiritual sense that I know. The White House might as well be called a whorehouse because they are prostituting American liberty, American rights, And the church is silent. And the church, which is supposed to be the conscience of a community, conscience of a country, remains silent, just as they were in the days of Nazi Germany. Nobody wanted to rock the boat. Everybody turned a blind eye. Why is America under attack? Well, she's the last buttress of Judeo-Christian values holding up liberty and pushing back global tyranny. With America out of the way, you better believe the globalist agenda will be realized. The church ought to recognize this most of all. Why are people missing the writing on the wall? It's because they're not reading the writing of God's will and they're not heeding the warnings of the watchmen on the wall. I've said it before, I'll say it again. If we don't wake up to it, we will not wake up from it. The mantra of landmark is we are to be awake over woke. We are to look to the book and the scriptures, not the culture. So I don't know how all this nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom is eventually going to accelerate and play out. Like I said, whatever it is, crisis coupled with leaders who are Christless, will show you the spirit of what is antichrist. So if it's World War III, somebody drops a bomb, whether it's the rapture, which I would call a global abduction. <laughs> you see where I'm going with that? Or if it's another outbreak of the fear variant, the writing is on the wall. The writing is not only on the wall, you can read about it on their websites. The World Health Organization has a global effort to keep the pandemic going. They are moving us forward with what is called the Pandemic Treaty. Here's what it does. It seeks to institute a coordinated effort of a one health, one narrative, one world order response system 
Despite global pushback, they are currently underway with plans to adopt what is known as the Political Declaration of the United Nations on Pandemic Prevention, Preparedness, and Response. And guess when that's happening? September 20th, 2023, one week from now. They are moving us closer to finalizing their vision for total health control. Now, in case you're like, why are you talking about this? Let me just show you the World Health Organization's logo. Of all logos, this is their logo. Some would say, Pastor Matt, that is, that's a Greek mythological logo. That is from Asclepius, the son of Apollo. He's the god of health and medicine. And I'm going, everything in mythological fables and stories are counterfeits to attack the true narrative. That is not a mythological Greek production. That is what God told Moses to hold up in the wilderness when they were plagued by serpents and snakes because they were complaining and the people were dying and the serpents were reflective of the curse, sin. And God said, Moses, I want you to make a bronze snake and pull a rod and put that which is cursing and plaguing the people on a pole and hold it up. And when their eyes look upon it, they will be healed. They will be saved. And that's why in John 3, Jesus pulled from that and called himself the snake, the curse, and said, when I'm lifted up, just as Moses lifted up the snake on the pole, when I'm lifted up, Jesus said, on the pole, I'm going to take all the sin of the world and anyone that looks upon me will be healed. You telling me it's a coincidence that the World Health Organization's logo wrapped in the globe is a serpent on a pole? Additionally, on December 1st of this year, it's the deadline to reject the amendments to the IHR, International Health Regulations, what are those suggestions? Well, mass vaccination for the whole world, just in case another pandemic was to break out. You know what else they're including in this IHR regulations? The censoring of all misinformation, AKA anyone that goes against the narrative. To further support their plans, two months ago, the European Commission and the WHO, World Health Organization, launched their global digital health certification, certification network, a la digital passports, that will help facilitate global mobility during pandemics, right? Because, quote, we want to have every country on board in order to foster peace and safety. Now, when you know your Bible, anytime you see those two words, this is what my mind does. Peace and safety, that's 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 3, where it says, for when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, contractions, and they shall not escape. All of this is a conditioning. What's the conditioning for? You give up your liberty, we will give you your peace and safety. Are you missing what you've went through the past three years? First, it was forcing something on your body, get comfortable with it. Then it was forcing something in your body, get comfortable with it. Because that's how this all unfolds and plays out. It's called social conditioning that leads to spiritual conforming. The more compliant the world becomes, the readier it will be for the great tyrant himself to come. He institutes a, let me take what they said, a one health, one narrative, one economy system. Revelation chapter 13, verse 16 helps us understand. It says of the Antichrist, this leader who is going to take world governments and have at his disposal all that authority. He calls his all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads. And that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. 
Now this is this political figure who is going to be the embodiment of Satan himself, the Antichrist. He's going to be charismatic. He is going to institute a system. This was far-fetched several decades ago. You know that, right? Really? A mark, forehead, on the right hand, where I can't engage in economy unless I participate in the program? <laughs> oh, my goodness. I need to check your temperature, sir. You want me on your forehead or on your wrist? Yeah. It's a counterfeit. It always is a counterfeit. The devil counterfeits everything God institutes. He mocks God. This system, which we know as the mark of the beast system or the number of his name, which is 666, where do you have it at? On your forehead or on your right hand? In Exodus chapter 13, verse 9, and in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 8, one of the things God instituted with his people in commemoration or memorial of the Passover, which is another symbol of the angel of death passing over the household because the blood of the lamb was on the doorposts. And when God delivered them from Egypt and instituted, delivered them, let me say, from slavery into liberty, he instituted Passover. And part of Passover was the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And he instituted it and said this, it shall be as a sign, as a sign, like a sign, where? To you, on your hand, and as a memorial between your eyes, that the Lord's law may be in your mouth, for with a strong hand the Lord has brought you out of Egypt. He's like, I have a memorial, which means remember what I did for you. I set you free from slavery. I'm your deliverer. So when you're doing this, it's like a sign on your hand, a mark on your head. It's not literal. It's not physical. It's spiritual. Remember, whatever you put your hands to do, do it unto the glory of God. Remember, whatever you think about, let the word of God dwell in your mind. It's the same idea in Deuteronomy chapter 6 with the Shema, which was the law of Israel. It was the great commandment. It was, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. And then he said this, teach these words to your children. Talk to them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up. Verse 8, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. The mark of the beast system is a total mockery of where the word of God should be in our lives. Which is interesting, we're either worshiping Christ or we are going to eventually worship the Antichrist. That's what that means. And some would say, this is ridiculous. A system with somebody else's name? 666? Okay, pastor, you've lost me. Nice shoes. Are they Jordans? Yeah, how did you know? <laughs> the icon on them. They have the jumpman mark. I could tell they're Jordans because they have his symbol. Nice shirt, Jay. Is that a Jordan shirt? How did you know? You're wearing number 23, and I just associate the number 23 with Michael Jordan. And again, that's a far analogy, but you get my point. We wear the names of men and their numbers all the time. This system is just going to be implemented in the same way. So what are we to do as Christians? We mark the error of the rebel we mark the lies of Babel, and we do that by knowing the truth of the Bible. The Word of God gives us insight. The Word of God gives us discernment. The Word of God, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 15, says, the spiritual man judges all things. The spiritual man discerns all things. And what the, God, what the Word of God produces in us is real. It's authentic. It's not artificial. And why you need to know truth is because we live in a day and age where lies aren't just coming from 
voices and mouths and humans. Lies now can come from all types of mediums, including what has swept the world lately in the area of AI, artificial intelligence. If you don't have any clue how impactful AI has become recently, I don't have enough time to talk about the different ways AI is sweeping the globe. I'll touch on a few things and how dangerous it can be in the hands of very evil, wicked people who are serving the agenda of the Antichrist, aware or unaware. And why we have the word of God is because the word of God does not produce artificial intelligence. The word of God produces spiritual intelligence. <laughs> artificial is manufactured. Artificial intelligence is computer-based. It's so unbelievable that it's no longer just operating out of proxy processes. Artificial intelligence today is able to learn and adapt like never before. So dangerous that a guy named Yuval Noah Harari, dangerous mind by the way, if you, if you watch any of his videos, this guy is a Hebrew scholar, he's a Jew, he's a professor, he's a prolific writer, he's a political commentator, he's associated with Klaus Schwab and the World Health Organization, and he had this to say about artificial intelligence. Watch this. You know, Gutenberg printed the Bible in the middle of the 15th century. The, the, the printing press printed as many copies of the Bible as Gutenberg instructed it, but it did not create a single new page. It had no ideas of its own about the Bible. Is it good? Is it bad? How to interpret this? How to interpret that? Um, AI can create new ideas, can even write a new Bible. We, you know, throughout history, religions dreamt about having a book written by a superhuman intelligence, by a non-human entity. Every religion claims our book, all the other books of the other religions, they, humans wrote them. But our book, no, 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 no. It came from some superhuman intelligence. In a few years, there might be religions that are actually correct, that just think about a religion whose holy book is written by an AI. That could be a reality in a few years. You know, Gutenberg printed the Bible. So if you ever wondered what the spirit of Antichrist looked like or sounded like, that's it. Talking about a holy book, contrary to every other holy book, if you heard what he said, which was written by man, including the Holy Bible. But this super intelligence is going to be able to, and they are, writing holy literature. There is an AI Jesus right now that is sweeping the globe where people are engaging AI Jesus and asking him deep questions about theology. And you better believe the bias that has been programmed into the algorithm is evil. It's anti-Christ, anti-church, anti-Christian. And you have no idea where this is leading. But perhaps somebody who helped create it can give us context. His name's Elon Musk. And in a documentary, which was entitled, Do You Trust This Computer?, he suggested that AI could spur the creation of a robot dictator that could rule mankind forever. He quoted saying this, if one company or small group of people manages to develop godlike superintelligence, they could take over the world, Musk said in the film. He continued, at least when there's an evil dictator, that human is going to die. But for an AI, there will be no death. It would live forever. And then you'd have an immortal dictator from which we would never escape. Now we know it's not going to be an immortal dictator, but the suggestion that AI is positioning planet Earth to receive a leader who would have at his disposal this technology which can propagate lies, which would likely lead to Revelation chapter 13, verses 14 and 15. And he, speaking of the false prophet who is going to be the partner of the Antichrist. Now, let me, hold up, look at me. The devil mocks God every chance he gets. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, triune God, Trinity. Satan is going to have 
a son. It's the Antichrist. And he's going to partner with a spiritual leader, an unholy leader, if you will. There's three, Satan, the Antichrist, and what I believe to be a spiritual leader that is going to have global influence. And he's going to point all worship to the Antichrist. And it says this, and he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast, the Antichrist, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image, the word is icon in the Greek, to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. Some suggest the Antichrist is going to suffer a mortal wound and he is going to come back to life. That's a mockery of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. This is what got me. In all the studying, what is the image of the beast? The word image is icon. It's a reflection or resemblance of an original. One of the Greek definition also says this, a high definition projection. It says that they're going to make it. They're going to create it. They're going to manufacture an image. Picture Nebuchadnezzar's statue in Daniel 3. And everyone was required to worship the statue. This might not be a physical statue. This is going to be something that projects. And verse 15 says that it's going to be given breath so that it can speak. And right now, these high definition projections that are powered by artificial intelligence in the likeness of certain people is deceiving because you think it's them and they're speaking. It's total deception. And what struck me was the fact that the Antichrist just wants to be worshiped and people will worship. How will they worship? The world is conditioned right now, whether they realize it or not, to worship. They worship this image of the beast on the screen. And you go, wait, whoa, whoa, hold up. If you know anything about history, they would wave flags and construct statues to the likes of Stalin and Mao and Hitler. And the leader, though it was not the system, the leader was never disassociated from the system. And though the system was not the leader, the system was never disassociated from the leader. What do you mean? When I say Hitler, you automatically think of Nazi Germany. When I say Nazi Germany, you automatically think of Hitler. So the system, which is going to be godless, which is going to deceive the world, is going to create the vein for the Antichrist to come out of the system, who's Antichrist, to cause the world to bow and worship, and they're going to make an image on the screen that will likely command people to bow and worship. And if you don't, you will be killed. And what hit me was they worship this image because they are already conformed to that image. You worship the image you're conformed to. Unholy people conform to the fallen world in the likeness of Satan. That's currently what's happening. They're conforming to a fallen world. And that's another mockery of God. God created, the enemy counterfeited. God created man in his image. The enemy wants to destroy that image in man and have them conform to his perverted image. Conversely, holy people are transformed by the risen Lord in the likeness of God. Unholy, conformed to the fallen world. Holy, transformed by the risen Lord. Let me say this, there is nothing artificial about our salvation or our sanctification. It is a supernatural work of the Lord. And we are currently witnessing two kingdoms clashing. One kingdom makes Christ God. That's the church. That's the believer. Man making Jesus Christ God. The other kingdom is man making himself God. And the devil's okay with that. That was the lie in Genesis chapter 3. Eve you can be like God. In the end, he doesn't care if we worship ourselves because he knows in the end, fallen man is going to worship him. When you see the technological advancements that are happening in our world as the sign of the times, you understand where all this is headed. Yes, it could be used for good, but artificial intelligence will spur on artificial lawlessness. 
see there are different types of lawlessness. One lawlessness is spiritual. Verse 7 in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, for the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. That's happening. Only he who now restrains, that's the Holy Spirit, will do so until he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. There's the second coming. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception, that's propaganda, among those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. Why are they perishing? They did not receive the love of the truth. Verse 11, and for this reason, God will send them strong delusion so that they believe the lie. Why would God do that? Because they're already believing the lie. They're giving their lives over to the lie and God is just giving them over to that lie. But it also tells us one other thing, that they may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. There's a clash of kingdoms. Those who are standing on truth and those who are standing on lies. And those who don't love the truth, those who did not receive the love of the truth will have a hatred towards those who actually love the truth. This is where this is going. Those who did not receive the love of the truth will hate you, who has a love for the truth, which is why Jesus said in the midst of all these contractions and all these moving parts, then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you. Welcome to Landmark Church. And you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake, Jesus said. Are you surprised that Christians are currently called hateful? Like true Christians that want to give love are called bigots. Jesus said, that's the trajectory of a Christless world. And then many will be offended, will betray one another, and will hate one another. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because lawlessness will abound, spiritual lawlessness and artificial, manufactured lawlessness, the love of many will grow cold. That phrase if Jesus is able to make love warm up, love heats up, love compels, the opposite, what is Antichrist, makes love grow cold and bitter and calloused and desensitized. You're going to send us out like that, Pastor Matt? No. Verse 13 and 14. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. The end of what? The end of your life. The end until Christ returns and the promise and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations and then the end will come the same nations that will have a hatred for the church amongst those nations will be those who God deems worthy to save and his gospel must be preached in all those nations and then the end will come so our job as Christians is to trust in God's providence. The only way that you will have a spiritual perseverance is if you have a faith that trusts in God's providence. I don't know how all this is gonna play out in my own life, but I have a God who does. Therefore, I'm going to allow him in me to keep enduring. At the end of the day, it's the kingdom of light versus the kingdom of darkness. You have the Father you have the Son and you have the Spirit. You have the Father of truth, you have the Son of truth, and you have the Spirit of truth. On the other side, you have the Father of lies, you have the Son of lies, the Antichrist, and you have the unholy spiritual leader of lies. That's how this ends. The Word of God tells you what happened. The Word of God tells you what will happen. It's predictive. It's prescriptive. It's proactive. It arrives perfectly on time. And when I yield to the word of God and I let the word of God have its way in me, there is a stiffening of the spine and there's a strengthening of the mouth and you will speak. 
And that's all I got. That is all I got. We've run out of notes. So with that being said, let me pray. Father, we commit this to you. I pray that your spirit begins to decipher within our own hearts and minds what it is you want us to take away. We would go out and we would be bold for Jesus and that we would ask your kingdom to come in our lives, our marriages, our families, our communities. And we even now would place Jesus back on the throne of our hearts. We give him full access to this ministry, this body. Glorify yourself. We sing you do praise now in the name of Christ, I pray, amen.